Today's topic is behavior grass management, and I'm Dr. Lee Ann Dillard, the Alabama State Forage Extension Specialist. So behavior grass, um, this is one of the grasses that um, we used to kind of pick on, but now as we've seen some problems with some of, the, of our other perennial options, it's quickly becoming more popular across the state. It is a long-lived warm season perennial. Traditionally, we see this grown in the southern half of Alabama, but there are varieties that um, are adapted up through most of North Alabama, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. It's commonly used for pasture, but it can use for hay, be used for hay, erosion control, and wildlife habitat. Also, it's pretty common to use it in a sod-based rotation, especially in the Gulf Coast region of the state. As um, you would plant peanuts or cotton for several years and then put it into bay hay grass for a couple of years. And this picture here is from a successful sod based rotation in Florida. So, what are the characteristics of bay grass? It is very grazing tolerant, and I'll talk about why that is a little bit later. But compared to some of our other uh, forage options, it is very grazing tolerant. It does have few disease and insect problems compared to. Bermuda grass, which obviously has Bermuda grass stem maggot, and some of our, our other issues with other perennials such as fall fescue as well. Um, it's very drought tolerant. It only has moderate forage quality, but it also only needs low to moderate fertility. So compared to like, a, uh, I'll compare this a lot to Bermuda grass, as that is our most common warm season perennial grass in Alabama. But Bermuda grass um, is most successful under high fertility um, conditions. So this does give us an option for a lower fertility forage. It's also tolerant of soil acidity, which um, for about three quarters of the state can be an issue. So that's a good thing. But I will say that if you live in a black belt soil that is very basic, um, say over seven and a half or eight, you may have struggle to get it established. It is gonna work better more on the neutral to acidic side. So this graph demonstrates um, the different growing seasons of different common grasses here in Alabama. And these are gonna be our warm season perennial grasses. As you can see, the hay grass, which is the top row, will grow from anywhere to mid-March through the beginning of November. Now we can pair that with an improved Bermuda grass or a hybrid Bermuda grass such as Tip 85 or Russell. And it's gonna have a much shorter growing season, roughly mid-May, through the beginning of October. But you can also see the relative forage yield of Bermuda grass is higher than that of Bahia grass. But again, the growing season is quite shorter. Now common Bermuda grass is gonna have a little bit longer growing season um, than the hybrid Bermuda grass, but not much. But then obviously there you're sacrificing yield. Dallas grass, which is a pretty common forage, especially in the black belt, but growing across the state, has uh, a similar growing season to that of Bahia grass. Um, and then Johnson grass, which um, again is probably most popular as a forage in the black belt, but does grow extensively across the state, um, is again going to be a little bit shorter than that of hay grass. So hay grass of our warm season perennials does have the longest growing season. Now there are several different varieties of hay grass. Um, Pensacola is probably the most common. Most people have heard of Pensacola. Um, it's best used on less fertile soils and in pastures that will not be well managed. It is kind of what we consider the parent of most of our improved Bahia grass varieties. Um, for the most part, I don't suggest using this anymore because we do have improved varieties, but you can still find plenty of fields that are planted in Pensacola and can easily get Pensacola seed. Argentine was the original bahia grass that was brought actually from Argentina South in South America. It's not very cold tolerant and it's very susceptible to ergot or fungus disease. So we don't see that as much anymore. It's also the lowest yielding of our varieties. Um, and honestly, I'm not even sure if you could find seed anymore for this, but it is the original bahia grass that was brought to the US. So I thought it was worthy of bringing up. This picture here um, you see on the screen is actually of um, Pensacola and Argentine, and you can see the, the difference in uh, the leaf size as well as the productivity. Um, in this particular picture, Argentine has a little bit of a bigger leaf size. Pensacola has a finer leaf, 
which um, a lot of producers prefer the final leaf to the hay grasses. So tipton nine is probably the most common variety that we see planted currently. Um, it is a derivative of Pensacola, but it has greater, greater seedling vigor, which is important. And that is one issue with the hair grass is establishment can be difficult. Um, it also has a more upright growth habit, which makes it better for hay production. And it also produces 25% greater yield than Pensacola. And this is why we suggest planting it rather than Pensacola. Um, as the name suggests, it was developed in Tipton, Georgia. So it has moderate cold tolerance into central Alabama, um, where again, Argentina is gonna do much better in the extreme Gulf Coast, the Panhandle, Florida, and places like that. Um, AU Sand Mountain as, uh, was developed here in Auburn, in Alabama, um, actually at the Sand Mountain Research Station in Crossville. So this was, I believe, a stand of Pensacola that was planted in Sand Mountain just to see how it would do. And a few of um, the plants survived, and they were able to ecotype it and sell it as AU Sand Mountain. It is the most cold tolerant. If you are um, Birmingham North, this would, is the variety that I would suggest planting. Some of the others may survive, but this is going to be the most prolific. Um, in recent years, it's been difficult to find seed. But I actually um, recently spoke with a seed producer in Geneva County that is producing Sand Mountain seed um, and selling it through the Alabama Farmers Co-op. So the seed is limited, but you will be able to find some this year um, if you are in the northern third of the state. Tip Quick is a variant of Tip 9, which again is going to be from Pensacola. As I said, Pensacola is kind of the, the parent of most of our varieties. Um, it is superior in seedling vigor to tipton 9. Um, otherwise, it's essentially tipton 9. So all the other characteristics are very similar. I will mention, and, and I haven't yet, that all of these varieties, you're going to see um, the quality is pretty much standard across all of them. The big difference is going to be in the yield, and that's where the benefit's going to be. Um, tip quick, as the name suggests, does um, germinate a little bit faster and have a higher germination rate. Then tips and nine, it is a little bit more expensive. So that's where, you know, you have to consider your personal situation, whether how long you can keep cattle off of the pasture, whether you choose between tip quick and tip nine. The last variety I'm going to talk about is the variety developed at the University of Florida, DUF Riata. It has later fall growth and earlier in the spring compared to our tips and varieties, um, but it's only been studied in the lower coastal plain of Alabama. And since it was developed in the Panhandle of Florida, uh, its cold tolerance has not been really pushed. Um, I really like this variety, especially, like I said, if you are, um, you know, in the coastal plain, the lower coastal plain, the headland area, the mobile area. Um, but at this point, we need to do further studies to see how far north we can successfully grow UF Riata. So here's a picture comparing um, some of the varieties that I talked about. This was in Headland, which is outside of Dothan, the Wiregrass Research Station, um, about 10 years ago. And it just kind of shows you the differences. You can see the tip to nine um, is a much thicker stand than that of the Pensacola. Also, again, I mentioned it, remember it has a much more erect growth habit, and you can see that as it's slightly lodged compared to the Pensacola, which is much lower growing. And it's really difficult, as you can see here, to see the difference between the tip quick and the tip nine. Again, remember, tip quick is tip nine, which is a little bit better seedling vigor. So the plant itself is, is pretty much the same. So establishment of the hay grass. Um, as with most forages, prepared seedbed is always the preferred method. Now, obviously, if you are in highly erodible soils, um, this is not the method I would suggest. But if you are in an area um, that is, uh, you're capable of doing the prepared seed bed, um, be it full tillage or conservation tillage, this will increase your germination, which is again, one of the challenges of dealing with, uh, excuse me, the hay grass. So you wanna plant scarified seed that basically is a conditioning of the seed, either it can be physical or they actually like uh, basically scrape the seed or it can be chemical. Um, again, a lot of our warm season forages and the hay grass in particular have a very thick seed coat, which is why we get a lot of hard seed. Um, it is seed that will germinate, but not necessarily in the first year or the, at, when we plant. So by scarifying it, it helps the plant, the 
the seed germinate faster. Um, we do want to plant about 10 to 15 pounds of the acre in March or April, so around this time of year. We don't want to go deeper than an inch, um, so about a quarter to a half an inch. I always suggest to producers it's much better to go to shallow than it is to go too deep. So I would make sure your drill is set at a quarter of an inch, and then in some areas where it may be less firm, you may go down to a half an inch and that's okay. Um, in this also, cultipacking and making sure we have a firm seabed is very important. You can see in this picture here um, that I took um, several years ago at some plots we were doing that um, the, while we do see some divots from this, the tractor tires, they're not very deep. So we wanna make sure we have a good firm seabed before we plant. You can broadcast um, the hair grass. You do wanna increase your seeding rate to about 18 to 20 pounds per acre um, in this scenario so that you're able to, cause you're gonna have less seed to soil contact so that you're able to have more seed out there. Now, with Tipton 9 and Tipton Quick, since they have better germination, it is suggested that you can reduce the seeding rate a little bit compared to the more traditional like Pensacola. So the suggestion for tip to nine and tip quick are eight to 10 pounds per acre when you drill it, either no-till or in conventional till, and 12 to 15 pounds per acre in broadcast. Now when it comes to the other varieties, we don't have as much information, our other novel varieties. So with those, I would suggest using the higher seeding rate when in doubt. It's always better to have a little too much seed than, than not quite enough, um, especially in a crop that is, is difficult to establish. So, um, but if you are using the Tipton varieties, you can reduce that a little bit, which obviously uh, reduces your cost per acre in establishment. So in terms of fertility, I mentioned um, already that uh, the hair grass has a lower fertility requirements than some of our other warm season perennials. So our general recommendation is 75 to 175 pounds to the acre. Uh, I would say 75 is gonna be for a pasture situation, and then 175 is going to be in a hay situation and also if you are considering um, producing seed. And I'll talk about the, um, the, the benefits of, of keeping your field for seed production a little bit later. Um, as with all crops, we do need potash as well as phosphorus. And we note those at 40 pounds to the acre of peas. And that is in terms of P2O5 and K2O. Um, it is tolerant of soil acidity, but we still need lime. Obviously, our soils are naturally very acidic um, outside the black belt. So annual lime is going to be anywhere from 0.3 to 0.5 tons per acre. I would defer to your soil test when it comes to this. Um, you always want to soil test and follow your soil test recommendations. Uh, many of our soils in Alabama are high in phosphorus and probably won't require it. Um, and many of our soils are acidic, so we probably will need more lime. So um, in pastures, we do suggest soil testing every two years, and in hay crop situations, um, we suggest doing it every year. So the typical forage quality for Bahia grass is about 85 to 90 uh, RFQ, or relative forage quality. To give you an idea of what that means, Bermuda grass can range from 90 to 100, and novel tall fescue is anywhere from 100 to 120. So you can see it's slightly lower than Bermuda grass, and I would say that um, it's slightly lower in quality or similar in quality to that of coastal Bermuda grass. Um, the thing, one thing that's unique about the hay grass is close grazing is necessary to obtain good utilization. But as I mentioned earlier, all varieties are similar in quality. So planting the new varieties are, are not really gonna get you a benefit there, but they will increase your yield, which will include, increase your carrying capacity. When we look at the forage yield, and now this is Pensacola at different nitrogen fertilization and clipping frequency, um, we can see that with no nitrogen application, on average, we're producing about 1,240 pounds of dry matter per acre, and that's averaged across clipping frequency of every week, two, three, four, or six weeks. Um, now, when we look at just the addition of 50 pounds of nitrogen, we're able to almost double that. Um, and 100 pounds, again, we're not seeing quite the same increase. Now at 200 pounds of nitrogen, we do see it jump up to about two and a half tons uh, per acre, which is quite substantial. 
But still, when you consider Bermuda grass and think about Bermuda grass is going to be produce seven, eight tons of dry matter per acre, we're still seeing it's relatively low. Um, obviously, the less frequent you clip, the more um, biomass uh, you're going to produce. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of clipping frequency. Maybe, you know, you can either see that in terms of hay clippings or in rotational grazing. So we do suggest about a 28 to 30 day rest period in behavior grass. And so you would see that around the four week mark, um, which is here. So we've got 1,300 pounds at none, up to 5,600 pounds per acre at 200 pounds of nitrogen. So again, the recommended rate that we suggest is somewhere between that 50 and 100, you know, about 75 to 100 pounds uh, nitrogen per acre. So improved varieties, remember I told you that they're gonna produce more. So this, this study was done on Pensacola. So remember that if you're planting Tipton 9, Tipton Quick, UF Riata, you're gonna easily get 10 to 15% more yield compared to this table. So looking at forage availability, and I brought this up because I've mentioned now several times that um, close grazing is the best way to utilize the hay grass, which is kind of the opposite of what we typically say, right? We typically say, uh, eat half, leave half. Well, in, in the hay grass, the growth habits a little bit different than most forages. So to leave half, we're actually going to have to graze it a little bit closer than we would with some of our others. So when we look at... Um, our Bahia grass, and we look at two inches to greater than five inches, and you add those numbers of percent of forage cutting height, and it doesn't matter which column you use, which nitrogen rate. Let's, let's for these purposes, talk about New York, uh, no nitrogen application, so this column right here. You can see that um, for every inch, you're gonna see roughly, and this should be four to five, not four to 52, um, 9.4, 8%, almost 10%, 11%, so when you add those up, in the above two inches, you're only going to have 40 to 50% of your total forage yield. Now, for most of our forages, we talk about grazing down to only three to four inches. Um, Bermuda grass, we can push a little bit lower. But so if this is 40 to 50% and above two inches, your bottom two inches are going to have over at least half of your forage biomass. So that's why we say that to get the best utilization, you really have to push it a little bit further than you do some of our other grass options. Now, having said that, we only want to do that in an established stand. If this was the first year of the stand, I definitely would not push it that far. But if it's an established stand of the hair grass and it's, it's, you're following appropriate uh, fertility, then you should be able to push it down into that right at two inch mark. Um, and you can see just in the first inch, this last row here, 40% of the grass is in that first inch. So it does make uh, it a bit challenging to manage. You also need to keep this in mind when looking at um, hay production. Now, again, remember these data is from Pensacola. Um, and I did tell you the tips and varieties have more erect growth habit. So the data would be a little bit different with those. We might see the numbers shift a little bit upwards. But if you are dealing with Pensacola, uh, unfortunately, we see that uh, about 40 to 50 percent of our forage is in that first inch. So grazing management, the carrying capacity for the hay grass is about three quarters to about 1.25 animal units per acre per year. And the animal unit is defined as a thousand pounds of animal, be that two 500 pound steers or 1,000 pound cow. So comparing that to Bermuda grass, um, it's about one to one and a half. So Bermuda grass is able to carry a little bit more. As mentioned it several times, Bermuda grass is higher yielding than the hair grass. And the novel tall fescue um, is about a half to one. So similar, a little bit lower. So it does have a pretty good carrying capacity. And remember, it's going to be growing a little bit longer than the Bermuda grass. The Bermuda grass is just so much more productive. You're going to have a higher stocking density for a shorter short period of time, where Bahia grass, you're gonna have a, a smaller stocking rate, a stocking density over a longer period of the year. So looking at performance, which is always important, um, this is stalker cattle data. Um, obviously, in terms of average daily gain, which is the easiest thing to measure, stalker cattle are kind of the easiest way to do this. 
we're going to see anywhere from three quarters to one pound per head per day. Um, this obviously is not going to be profitable. If you're working on a stalker cattle system, obviously stalkering cattle during the summer is a huge challenge. Um, when you compare that to Bermuda grass, we're talking about about uh, three quarters of that with what you would give Bermuda grass, and then even lower that in novel tall fescue. Tall fescue, um, the endophyte, the novel endophyte tall fescue, which obviously does not have uh, fescue toxicosis, um, it's going to be our cool seasons are always going to be higher quality than that of our warm season. Now, if you were to do this, um, keeping this in mind, this could easily be a, a system where you graze and also supplement stalkers, and that's how you could be economical that way. Um, it will be difficult to get enough gain on those stalker, though, to be able to um, be economical. Now, for a mature cow, um, this is perfect forage. It meets your quality demand quite well. Um, so it's really good for cow-calf operation. So hay management. Um, obviously, hay is quite popular in the hay grass. Um, one, because it is more drought tolerant and tends to stay green longer during the drought than Bermuda grass. Um, but also, there's a, a big interest at the moment from the horse industry in the hay grass because it's perceived to have um, less uh, carbohydrates or less sugars available, so it's better for laminated horses. Um, also, uh, it has a more finer, finer leaf. So it is moderate quality when cut in less than five week intervals. So this is going to be similar to Bermuda grass. You want to be cutting this approximately every 28 to 30 days. The TDN is going to be 50 to 56 percent. The requirement for a mature beef cow is 55. So again, as I said, it's good quality for your cow-calf operation. Crude protein is gonna range from nine to 11%. A lot of that's gonna be dependent on the weather conditions as well as your nitrogen fertility. Um, nitrogen fertility has a huge impact on crude protein. Again, for a mature cow, we're talking about eight to 9% requirement. So again, it's gonna be able to meet her demands. Um, for a stalker cow, uh, we're talking about upwards of 65% to 70% TDN requirement and more 14 to 15% crude protein, so that you're likely gonna to have to supplement those animals. Um, as I just mentioned, the majority of the forage biomass is below one and a half to two inch mower cutting height. So it's typically not considered a good species for hay production. I would say that the caveat to that is if you are working with an improved variety, uh, tip to nine, tip to uh, tip quick or UF Riata, you can more successfully make hay. I'm not saying that there are people that you can't make hay on Pensacola Bahia grass. You definitely can, but your yield will suffer. Um, and really, uh, below one and a half to two inches, um, even if we were able to cut lower than that, you would be getting so much soil into your hay, you would really be reducing the quality of it. So um, I would suggest if you're interested in Bahia grass hay, looking for an improved variety. You're also going to get higher yield, which is going to help you be more profitable. So bahia grass can be invasive in Bermuda grass hay fields. Um, so if you do have bahia grass that you're grazing um, or cutting for hay and also Bermuda grass, I would um, you know, try my best not to let there be any contamination. Washing equipment before you go between fields and not feeding bahia grass hay in Bermuda grass. Um, there, while there's no effect on nutritive quality, because bahia grass will dry dark, darker than the Bermuda grass, um, it's not very visually appealing. Um, there are some options of dealing with Bermuda, uh, Bahia grass and Bermuda grass, but they're extremely expensive. So um, prevention is the best case here if you are trying to keep them separate. Um, so this is a graph just showing the average forage yield from either tip to 85 or coastal Bermuda grass versus tip to nine Pensacola and Argentine Bahia grass. And this was done in Tipton, Georgia. So uh, southern uh, Georgia and the coastal plain over three years. And we can see, as you would expect, Tipton 85 is the highest producing of all five varieties, um, pushing about 1,700 pounds of dry matter per acre. Now, coastal did um, a little bit worse, but it was higher than the Tipton 9. And then we look at our Tipton 9, Pensacola, Argentina, you can see they kind of stair step down. So again, if you're in hay production, um, I would suggest it's probably worth it to upgrade to tip to nine. Um, if you are using Pensacola, just for the added yield, you're going to get about 2,000 uh, 2, more pounds of dry matter 
um, on average per year when you have tryptonine compared to Pensacola. So seed production, and this is something we see quite a bit in Florida as well as South Alabama as a way of getting a little extra money off your pasture. So it can be an additional source of income on both pastures and hay fields. Newer varieties are plant variety protected, so it is illegal to collect seed unless it's a certified field. And those are gonna be your UF Riatas, your Tipton 9, Tipton Quick. This does not apply to Pensacola. So if you have a Pensacola field, you can very easily harvest your seed. Um, fields of Pensacola in Argentine can be harvested to offset fertilizer and other production costs. Um, they produce about 150 to 400 pounds of seed per acre. And um, depending on the year, um, again, that could easily set off your fertilizer cost if nothing else. There are several custom uh, seed combines in Alabama that will come and um, harvest your seed for you. So the growth of tillers that later develop into seed heads is stimulated by grazing and mowing. So we suggest um, grazing and mowing through the beginning of the summer, applying 100 pounds and then applying 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, producing seed is quite expensive from an energy standpoint. They do have a higher fertility requirement. So one of the challenges of doing this is to determine when seed is, is time to harvest the seed. Maturity rates will vary, so you want to check multiple seed heads. But the easiest thing to do is just grab the seed head, try to strip it with your hand, and if the seed is mature, it'll easily release from the seed head. In bahia grass, color is not the greatest indicator of whether the seed is mature or not, because often it's still green, but ready to be harvested. You want to dry the seed as quickly as possible to avoid any heat damage as obviously the seed um, is going to mature at different rates throughout the field, so you will have some immature seed that will not be completely uh, dried in the field. So the timing is gonna be on each year, is gonna be dependent on rainfall, fertility, and management, but generally we're gonna say mid to late June in the coastal plain. So weed management in behavior grass, as with any pasture or hay field, the best defense and management is to promote a dense vigorous behavior grass growth. Um, by managing it correctly in terms of fertility and um, cutting or grazing height, we can make sure that our behavior grass is able to compete. Behavior grass is extremely competitive and is able to, under the right conditions, outcompete most of them. And as an example of that, is many Bermuda grass uh, producers have it as a weed in their Bermuda grass. So for broadleaf weeds, um, the easiest option is 2,4-D but we do not want to do that during the establishment year or before behavior grass is about eight inches tall. For grassy weeds, specifically daisy grass and smut grass, which tend to be problems um, in behavior grass, you can use Velfar, which is going to be, again, an expensive option. You want to apply it April through late July at about 0.67 to 0.12 pounds of active ingredient per acre. You can only apply this when the soil moisture is sufficient. Humidity is high and the air temperature is greater than 80 degrees Fahrenheit. It will injure the bahia grass by temporarily burning and yellowing it at about two to four weeks after application, but it will help reduce your basic grass and smut grass. So for more specific situations on your weed control options, I would suggest going to the ACES website, um, aces.edu, search IPM guides and pull up this publication which is IPM 0028, Pastures and Forage Crops Insect and Weed Control Recommendations. Um, this is gonna give you um, information on uh, specifically what uh, herbicide options are currently labeled, <coughs> excuse me, in Alabama for um, the hay grass. I would also say, regardless of what this publication says, always read the label of the herbicide so that you can verify that it will not kill your bahia grass. So as part of this, I wanted to bring up a current topic or a, a new upcoming topic, which is runs with grass. <coughs> Excuse me. So Brunswick grass is an emerging weed problem in Bahia grass. And the reason it's emerging is because it's a cousin to Bahia grass. They look very similar, but unfortunately, given even though it's got moderate quality, it's not palatable to livestock. 
So you can see in this field, um, which was in, I believe, Levi County, uh, Florida, the tufts of grass that you see in that field are Brunswick grass, and the overeaten areas are the Bahia grass. So you can see how quickly it could take over a field because the cattle are going to select for the Bahia grass, make it weaker, and since they're not grazing the, the Brunswick grass, it's able to take over quite quickly. So it can outcompete Bahia grass and basically lead to a field of what is a Bahia grass look like. And I'll show you um, some pictures in a minute to kind of so you can distinguish between the two. Um, I will say we have this grass in, or this weed in Alabama. We do not see it nearly as much um, as, a, as a problem in Florida, but we do have it in Alabama. So at this point, what we're trying to do is trying to make it, keep it from becoming a problem and control it before it does. So in this picture, you can see Brunswick grass has a seed head very similar to Dallas grass. It's got three to four racemes, which are the lines of seeds, compared to Bahia grass, which typically has two. Um, always remember that you want your Bahia grass to give you the peace love sign. Um, if it's not doing that, um, it's either in, infested with Dallas grass or Brunswick grass. Now Brunswick grass in terms of the leaves are going to be very similar to Bahia grass, where Dallas grass has a much thicker leaf. Um, so when you look at the bunch of grass, you can tell the difference between the Dallas grass and the Bahia grass. Now Brunswick grass, Bahia grass, and Dallas grass are all in the same genus. So that's what can make them very difficult to um, distinguish is because they're very close cousins. So Brunswick grass, just like Bahia grass, is a perennial summer grass. It has a similar growing season and appearance to that of Bahia grass. And you can imagine if you were looking at this field without the seed heads, you could very quickly just assume that it was a field of Bahia grass. So um, again, it has similar flowering to the Pensacola Bahia grass, but it often has three to four racemes per head. Um, and I will tell you, even our um, Bahia grass expert down in Florida, Dr. Ann Blunt, who is the one that kind of initiated this, initially she had a hard time telling the difference. And she's a forage breeder, and this is what she does every day. So they are very, very similar. So the easiest thing to do to confirm or deny if you have Bermuda, uh, Brunswick grass, excuse me, is to dig up the, the roots. So um, especially if there's not seed heads present to be able to look at. If you look at Brunswick grass, it has long skinny rhizomes and you'll see it tiller where the plants are connected. Where Bahia grass has a much short stubby rhizome, um, you can see it there, it's kind of shaped like a J and it's not going to be connected um, as these are. You see that you have what appears to be two plants connected by the same root. You're not gonna see that in the hay grass. So you can also look at the seed. There is, while the seed is similar in size and color, Brunswick grass seed typically has a bullseye on it, um, as you can see in the picture there, um, compared to the hay grass, which is usually a, a lighter color of brown, um, not in this picture, but it usually is more of a white color. Also, it's not going to have the dot in the middle. Um, so that's the easiest way to tell um, on, on a seed wise. So again, prevention is the key to control this problem. Um, and we do this by buying certified seed. Um, we just talked a little bit about seed production and, and how that can be used as a secondary source of income. But the way this has gotten around and spread is through brown bag seed because it is not tested for contamination. So certified seed is always tested. It has to be in certified fields which are, chest, are checked um, regularly to see for any weed um, component. And also they go through a lab and here's an example of a seed tag you see here and it's going to list the amount of weed seed. Now uh, Brunswick grass is not listed as a noxious weed. Um, any noxious weed seed that's found has to be listed on the label, but you can call the certifying lab, give them the information there about the lot, um, and they can tell you any weed seeds they found. Um, they just don't print it on the tag. But certified seed does have to have, um, I think, below 0.1% weed seed um, total. This also gives you, obviously, information on uh, germination rates hard seed and things like that to help better calculate your seeding rates. So insect management, um, probably the most common concern for insects in Bahia grass is fall armyworms. 
Um, there are some other uh, smaller issues with uh, bill bugs and things like this, but I didn't, I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to focus on fall armyworms. Um, they do have the most severe outbreaks late summer, early fall after a dry period. Um, we see that, right, some years we don't get very much, and then other years it takes off and we see a horrible amount of fall armyworms. Um, they will reduce the yield, but usually if you have a good established stand, you don't have to worry about um, the stand being killed. You're just going to reduce your grazing. Um, I will say anecdotally that most people see that uh, the fall armyworms will attack other forages first before they become to the bahia grass, which I think is kind of a, a, a good thing. So you'll see they'll take out the Bermuda grass first and then it'll come back to the bahia grass. Um, you can treat for fall armyworms, but usually in bahia grass, given the quality and the yield, the loss is not enough to justify the treatment because it is quite expensive. But again, um, if you are interested in learning more about fall armyworms and management in bahia grass or other pasture crops, you can either go back to our IPM guide um, for insect and weed control recommendations. Also, we do have a separate publication on management of fall armyworms in pastures and hayfields. Um, that talks specifically about just fall armyworms. And those can again be found on the ACES website, aces.edu.